It's time for another episode of The Sean Tabbitt Show, a podcast where I connect you with thought leaders from across the globe, digging into some of my favorite topics like personal development, marketing, spirituality, and pretty much any other shiny object that happens to catch my attention. Today, my special guest is the one and only Christine Kane, and we're going to be talking about her brand new book, How Did I Get Here? Finding Your Way Back to God When Everything is Pulling You Away. Christine, it is truly an honor. Welcome to the show. Sean, I'm pumped to be on the show. Thanks for having me. Oh, definitely my pleasure. I'm always excited when I get to meet somebody for the first time, one, to learn about them, and two, to see where the Holy Spirit takes our conversation. So I'm eager to find out where we're going to end up today. However, I know for some of my audience, you are going to be brand new. So for the men and women meeting you for the first time today, tell us a little bit of the Christine Kane origin story. What are a few things we absolutely need to know about you? Okay, well, as you can tell from my accent, I'm not from Texas. And so I was born in um, Sydney, Australia. So this is how the Queen wishes that she could speak English. This is the very refined way of speaking English. But uh, my parents are Greek. So Greek was my first language. I don't know, Sean, if you've ever seen my big fat Greek wedding, but that is my big fat Greek life. That is like (laughs) literally, (laughs) you think it's a stereotype. It is my life. And so, um, I, I, you know, Sydney is a beautiful, beautiful city. Um, I have a little bit of a, a pain in my past, you know, I was, uh, when I was 33 years old, I found out that um, I had been left in a hospital unnamed and unwanted when I was born and that I had been adopted, which is a a strange thing to find out when you're 33, to find out you're not who you thought you were. And um, I'm also the the survivor of uh, sexual abuse. When I was young, um, I was victimized for many years. And so with that, I guess, as you could imagine, you know, I, I was a young woman that was full of a lot of shame and a lot of uh, guilt, a lot of anger and bitterness and unforgiveness. And, um, you know, I encountered the reality of a life transforming relationship with Jesus um, and really became a fully devoted follower of Jesus in my early 20s uh, by the grace of God. Um, and he literally changed my life. And so I'm, I'm one of those that, um, you know, uh, really did have my life transformed. And um, and and I'm living proof by the grace of God today that your history doesn't have to define your destiny. And it would be just like God. my husband and I oversee today the A21 campaign, which is a global anti-human trafficking um, organization. We have offices in 15 countries around the world uh, where we help to you know reach the vulnerable and to rescue victims and to restore survivors. Um, it would be just like God to take someone with a background like mine, not only redeem my own life, but then use me by his grace to set other people free um, in life. And so that's a little bit of uh, what we do. I also run Propel Women, which just helps to um, helps women to fulfill their passion, their purpose, and their potential all around the world. We're in 120 countries around the world. And then obviously do a lot of uh, speaking and teaching um, and inspiring people to overcome the obstacles of their past and step into their future. Well, thank you for that little bit of context. Uh, in terms of some of the ministry you do, I love that God always uses our woundedness, our scars, the things that he's healed us from. A lot of times those are the exact places he wants us to have authority and to really, I, I would say, to further the kingdom and steal back around the enemy has taken in other people's lives. Uh, that's a, a wonderful thing that God does. The kingdom is real upside down. You wouldn't think somebody who was wounded or injured in a way should be the exact person to be doing ministry in a space if God says, no, in my kingdom, that's exactly how it works. So I, I love that. I love that. Thank you for sharing that about your story. And uh, in terms of writing, what number book is this for you? Oh, wow. Okay. Well, <laughs> so I, I think all up, including um, my early, early books that I self-wrote, I, I'm going to have to count, but I, I would think I'd be somewhere up around Um, 11 or 12, because there were early ones that I did um, in the early 90s. Uh, You know, thank God that they're now out of print. But, you know, (laughs) it's all a journey step by step. Um, We get there. But, you know, most of uh, everything that I write has flowed out of my life experience and things. I generally find that if the Lord's teaching me something um, and has, you know, and, and has enabled me to grow through it, that normally that's going to help somebody else down the track. You know, there's other people that are a lot smarter than me and, and uh, you know, that they, they can write great textbooks and great theological, uh, theologically dense books. But most of mine is um, I'm a little bit like the woman at the well, still all these years later that says, come, you know, see this man that told me everything about what, and it's just this 
ongoing thing that everything flows out of. Well, come and see what Jesus did for me. Maybe this will help you too. Well, I, I love that uh, you're happy that some of those early books are out of print. I, I feel like whether it's your first book or your 51st book, every writer always struggles with a little bit of what I like to call writer's remorse, where you would go back and say something differently or you've further lived out that revelation. So you would say the book completely differently if it was written in this season. Um, I'm appreciative that you got to learn how to write somewhere. So we have the fantastic books now uh, that you're sharing with the world. Uh, in terms of the the story behind this book, you know, just like every person has an origin story, every book had to start somewhere. So talk to us a little bit about the season that you were, uh, we might say, kind of trudging through, slogging through that this book eventually comes out of. Sure. Well, you know, I think it was uh, really towards the end of 2016 through 2017, 2018. Um, so by the time we got to the pandemic of 2020, man, I was like, I was ready. I was ready to help people. but. It was like a perfect storm is probably the best way that I can uh, phrase it. You know, I was um, doing what we do, be, you know, ministry around the world. My husband and I are just constantly um, traveling, loving it. Like it's really a grace to do what we're called to do. Um, but I had a, a season at the end of 2016, my mother passed away in Australia. Well, uh, you know, we're living in America. My sister-in-law, who's my age, who was my age? Um, she also passed away of cancer. Then my one of my bro- my husband's sisters died, and one of his other brother in laws died. And it was like in a three month period, there was just like bang, bang, bang. Um, and I think because of my background and uh, the issues of adoption and abandonment, with my mother's passing, it was a, a season where the Holy Spirit wanted to do just an even deeper work of healing in my own life, as is normally the case. You know, it's like. So that on its own would have been something that I kind of would have been uh, working through while you're leading a global organization and traveling and speaking and teaching. Um, But also during that season, uh, I had a a very dear friend that, you know, I I really sort of felt had betrayed me. And it's, you know, the um, David wrote in the Psalms, it would have been okay if it was my enemy that was against me. But when it was my friend that I went to the house of the Lord with, it kind of, cuts you at a whole different level. And I think it was, you know, while I was already trying to process this grief with my mum, process just uh, what it is to lead, you know, a couple of hundred staff around the world and just what happens with all of that. And, you know, Sean, when you're any kind of public figure, um, you sort of wake up every day and there's always the temptation to think, well, who am I going to disappoint today? Because there are always people that think you should be talking a lot more about this issue, or you should not be talking about this issue, or you aren't speaking enough about it, you know, and you kind of um, have got a whole lot going on. And I don't know if you have any recollection, but towards the end of 2016, 2017, there was a lot of volatility here in America. There was a lot of things going on, <laughs> you know, I just, I don't know if you've got amnesia, but it was a moment in the history of the nation. And so I think if you've got any kind of blue check mark next to your name, everybody's got an opinion about how and what and why. And so there was all of this kind of pressure. People forget like you're a human as well in the midst of it all. And you're trying to lead and you're trying to have wisdom and you're processing emotional things and you're tripping up as a human anyway, all of the things. And I remember this one night, my husband, who's uh, awesome and strange, was wanting just to have a chill out night. And so he was watching this documentary about the Navy SEALs and it's called Hell Week. And I'm like, I, you know, jump into bed to watch this thing with him. And I'm like, who would watch something called Hell Week? But, you know, that's my husband's relaxation. So he's watching this thing. And I'd always known, I'd always called us the Navy SEALs of the church. We're on the front line, man. We're rescuing slaves. We're empowering women. We're building the church. You know, that's always three decades of let's go for it. And, um, I, I found out that this Hell Week is actually designed to, it's, it's where you go. You're already an elite, elite uh, athlete and um, just obviously military person to go in there. Um, and only the best of the best get in. And then you have to go through this process where for one week they try to break you down mentally, emotionally. I mean, they're yelling at you. They're breaking you down emotionally. Uh, that You're not sleeping. They're, you're required to do all of these tasks. And the whole goal is to break you down because if they can break you there, you know, you, that, they don't want you to go on the front line where you're going to break. And they want you to ring the bell. And when you ring the bell, you can go have a shower, go back to your platoon. You're just like, that's it. The whole deal's done. 
And um, they dropped the guys out of a helicopter into the Pacific Ocean. They had to swim like miles to the bay, to the to the shore, and then do all of these other activities. So while this happens, I start crying, and my husband's like, "You know, why are you crying? Because guys have been dropped out of a helicopter." And I went, "You know, this is how I think I feel. I think this is explaining how I'm feeling after this endless." season of just what I felt constant bombardment spiritually and emotionally and physically and just it was consistent and uh, not ending you know and I said I feel like I've been dropped out of the helicopter and um, I'm in the freezing cold water I've got to swim miles to shore and here's the deal I know I can do it I know that uh, I'm not going to (laughs) die I know that I have the resilience the tenacity I've been here before I know I can do it but for the first time you know, over three decades of following Jesus, I don't know if I want to. And when those words came out of my mouth, Sean, that, that was, and when you think, where did the book title come from? That was, and I, I looked at him with tears streaming down my face and I went, how did I get here? Like, how would I, someone that is just like front lines going for it, how would I get to a point where I'm thinking, you know what, I might just take my foot off the gas. And here's the deal, Sean, I thought there's so little discernment in the Christian church I've got so much momentum from three months of doing, uh, three years, three decades, I'm sorry, of doing this, that most people, it's going to take them about a decade before they realize I even took my foot off the gas. It's just like, I've got so much momentum and I wasn't thinking I'm going to go and do anything bad or back, you know, nothing, but just take my foot off the gas a bit, not be on the front line where you're sort of a target or where you're just more vulnerable. It's just like, you know what? We could go buy a taverna in Santorini. We could sell baklava. I could talk to people about Jesus one-on-one, watch the sunset over the volcano and, um, you know, but just take my foot off the gas. And through my tears, I I said to my husband, I go, nobody would even hardly know, except for maybe really prophetic people that might be a little bit discerning. But apart from that, nobody would really know. And then I went, but Jesus would know. Jesus would know that I took my foot off the gas and that, I didn't press to the end, that I didn't go all out. And um, it was that moment of truly recognizing, wow, uh, my heart is really prone to drifting. In my case, not not like like that we've had a major thing in the Christian church over the last few years, so many very publicly walking away from their faith, deconstructing their faith, walking away from church or Jesus. It might was not that kind of thing, although that's the very real thing. But it was drifting from purpose, drifting from the mission, drifting from the pain of just going, maybe, maybe I'll pull back a bit, still stay in this thing, but just not like Paul, I press on, you know, determined to lay a hold of all of that for which Christ Jesus, it's like determined to lay a hold of some of that for which Christ Jesus has laid a hold of me. It was, it was that moment that really made me go on the journey. That's where the book came from of going, We all drift. It looks different. I mean, you can still be in leadership like me and your heart has drifted uh, and you don't have to even like go to idols or walk away from the faith or have some major sin in your life, but you can drift from the purpose to which Jesus called you. Um, And then, of course, that opens up all the other forms of drifting in life, whether it's relationally, spiritually, emotionally. And I'd say that the world in which we live in today, Sean, the currents have shifted so majorly. People are drifting left, right, and center. Well, I want to go back to what you said, you know, that you're kind of place where you just didn't know if you wanted to keep moving forward or keep following whatever you want to say. Um, as you process this, was that out of exhaustion, like fear of what it would take to get to the other side? Like what what was kind of that straw that broke the camel's back? Because it sounds like you got to a place where you're kind of stuck and you had to figure out a way forward. Very much so. I think it was for me in that particular season, it was truly understanding the cost of continuing to go forward. I think in in, in any capacity, if you've got any kind of public profile and the world in which we live, the, the cancel culture in which we live, the very social media world, it's like, you know what? Do I really want to keep doing this? Like in that sense, you know, you just kind of go, uh, you, you're almost not going to win no matter what you do. And there's so much polarization and so much chaos and so much division in our world. And I think you're seeing that in the secular realm, in the church realm, it doesn't matter which, you know, what, what uh, slice of life you're living in, uh, the divisiveness and the chaos and 
uh, I think what is happening in our world, the public shaming and the cancel culture and so many destructive things, you're just kind of going, you know, who wants to walk around with a target on your head? Uh, like I said, the idea of a taverna in Santorini is sounding really good right now. Um, and yet understanding that the gospel, you know, there's, if I was in Syria, maybe the cost of going forward uh, or in some other country, you know, could be losing your head or being put in jail. I mean, there's different forms of persecution sort of in a Western post-Christian culture where to even sort of uh, to, to truly be a, a, an orthodox, you know, by that I mean someone that, you know, asp- ascribes to historical orthodox traditional Christianity. Um, you know, in, in our world today, to even be that, to truly believe in the resurrection of Christ, to truly believe in the virgin birth, to truly believe, uh, use words like sin, heaven, hell. I mean, you know, uh, people think that, you know, concepts like that are, are, are dangerous or that you're bigoted or that you're narrow-minded or at the very least you're just uh, deluded or stupid. So to continue to walk forward with any kind of uh, uh, you know, public profile or passion or zeal, and particularly if you're like me with a, you know, I've got a lot of enthusiasm and zeal, and I'm from the segment of the church that is very demonstrative. And um, you kind of go, wow, uh, it, it's costly in the world in which we live to truly uh, keep doing that and um, to go forward. There's no sign of that letting up at all. I mean, the world, it's not like suddenly they're going to roll the red carpet out for Christians again and say, you know, go for it. Um, So there's a whole new era. You'd think after three decades where I had been counting the cost and doing the deal, you go, we're counting the cost all over again. And now the drift for me would look like, would I just settle in the comfort of what I've built at this point? And um, I could look like I'm still on the front lines, but really not be taking risks, really not be stepping wholeheartedly into the fullness of what God has. And I think it was the realization of that. It was a very sober time um, of going, you got to put that anchor down again, Chris, and you got to make sure you are anchored in Christ because uh, it's not anything else. Your hope, you know, the writer to the Hebrew says, Jesus is this hope we have as an anchor for our soul. And um, if you're anchored in anything else, Um, anything at all, I don't think you're going to make it in the way the world is going. Yes, uh, being anchored to anything else, while it might uh, fix something in the short term, eventually that will come up very, very short. Uh, In terms of relationships, like were there people that God put in your path that could see that you were struggling or were you like really carrying a lot of this burden just in your own head? Well, you know, I'm, I'm so grateful because I am married. I always like to say I'm married to the most ravishing piece of masculine flesh on planet Earth. And um, it truly, Nick and I have been married for 25 years. And ours, by the grace of God, is, is a true partnership. And, uh, you know, Nick has, um, he walked through every moment of this with me. And I had a couple of other very dear girlfriends. You know, I truly believe that uh, it takes a village. Um, you know, we're not meant to do this alone. I thank God that I had sewn into great friendships before stepping into this. I think we all uh, need to do that. And so Nick and two other um, great, very mature, strong Christian leaders that uh, just loved me unconditionally during that season. I I like to think, Sean, you know, the the story where Jesus talks about, you know, the four men that carried their friend, um, cut a hole in the roof and drop their friend at the feet of Jesus. I, I feel like there was a lot, a lot of times in that, that my friends truly carried me when I didn't feel like I had the strength uh, to keep going. And perhaps without that support, I may have rung the bill. You know, I think I, I may have taken my foot off the gas and gone, it's just too much. Um, but with their support and thank God, you, you know, you go, I'm, I'm really grateful that I was I practiced what I preached about being grounded in the word, being grounded in the house of God. And which is why when I wrote, uh, how did I get here? It's like, you know, um, at, I'm 55 this year and having walked with Jesus for a really long time through, through great times, but a lot of times of suffering and pain and disappointment and disillusionment and discouragement, you know, here are the nine signs of drifting. Um, and I could tell you, even having walked through that season in 2016, 17, 18, um, I, I could pretty much say that 
these are the markers. You know, my dad used to take us to the beach, uh, Sean, when I was living in Australia, at a beach called Yumina Beach. And, you know, we would, he would put a, a big beach umbrella up one side and beach towels on the other side. And he would tell us before we go out to swim, he'd say the undertow is so strong that you guys are just going to be playing. You're not even going to be thinking about it. And if you do not frequently check your markers, these beach towels and the beach umbrella, you are going to drift. And he would say to us constantly, kids, all you have to do to drift is nothing, nothing. You don't have to be, you know, oftentimes we think even in life, I, I, I'm going to wake up one day and decide, oh, I'm going to walk away from Jesus, or I'm going to leave my marriage, or I'm going to, you know, not talk to my kids, or I'm going to do something financially unethical. That's not normally what happens. You just either you don't pay attention to the things that you should be doing, which keep you from drifting. And I think that's the case for most people. It's not that we wake up and think, I'm just going to walk out of something today, or I'm going to, you know, walk in the opposite direction. More often than not, we have stopped checking our markers that actually would show us that we are drifting. And I think the subtlety of the enemy in this hour, the currents are shifting politically, socially, environmentally, economically, morally, every strata of society is being impacted and at a rapid rate, the currents have shifted. And many of us have forgotten to keep checking our markers and have woken up and gone, how did I get here? Like it's 2021. How did I get here? Um, Throw a global pandemic into the midst of it all. And I think spiritually, the Lord truly was giving me a message for this hour of going, Guys, you know, it's not like we're sort of used to seeing someone post on Instagram, you know, I'm walking away from Jesus, I'm leaving Christianity, I'm walking away from the church, I've deconstructed my faith. And we're all going, how did they get there? And while we're so busy wondering how everyone else got where they got, we're not checking our own markers and then waking up one day going, how did I get here? How did my marriage get here? How did I I get here with my family? How did I get here with my health? How did I get here with my fitness? How did I get here with my relationship with Jesus? And it's not so much that we woke up and started doing something bad. We just stopped checking our markers that keep us grounded in Christ. Well, and the theme I keep talking about really in the last six months is that we are in a back to basic season where those things that we so easily easily neglect in the busyness of life and ministry and work and family, you know, time in our prayer closet, time reading our Bible time getting our hands dirty and just serving and loving people. Not all of ministry life is fancy and up on the stage. Now there are times when we get to do that. There are people who do that regularly. Um, But if, if that's all it gets to be about, we really miss out on, I feel like those things that feed our soul, those things that keep us grounded and kind of on point or or, uh, really focused on where we need to be moving. Um, And also too, I just want to comment on, it's important that we have people that can speak into our lives, our, our spouse, um, two, three, four friends who are close enough to know the ins and outs of our life, to know when we're off course, to know when we're struggling. Uh, many of us don't have people who know us that well. So we just put on that, that you know, walk into church, happy face. I'm fine. You're fine. We're all fine. And we smile. Uh, yet we need people that we can be vulnerable with, people who are going to love us even when we make a mistake or uh, things aren't going well. And, you know, I can say as somebody who's been working with Christian leaders for the past decade plus, Leaders are some of the most lonely people out there where um, everybody puts them on a pedestal. Everybody always expects them to be on and to be performing and be kind of uh, flawless, really. Um, And that's just not a reality. I I can say for me, one of the joys of the work I do is getting to love on and serve and pray for and just uh, encourage leaders along the way. Because even the most accomplished leader needs a cheering section to help them get that book to the finish line or to, to keep moving um, in the midst of difficulties. And, and as you've alluded to, when you're a public figure, a public leader, there's always turmoil somewhere. And to be able to have people in your corner who are going to love you, regardless of what people are saying about you on social media, uh, that's super important. So whether, whether you're somebody, you're like, I'm somebody who nobody knows about, you need a, a spouse in your corner, you need those three, four friends in your corner, just like the leader does. And, and also, I would encourage you to if there are leaders that you love and you follow, be praying for them. They need your prayer coverage to do everything that they're doing because just like you get attacked uh, day by day, they get attacked day by day as well. So be sure to be lifting up those prayers. It may seem like a small thing, but it makes a dramatic, it makes a huge difference. Um, I think the place I'd love to go next is to have you tell us a little bit 
how do we realign ourselves? How do we get back on track? So you've talked a little bit about how we start to see these things where we're just, we're off course. We know something's wrong. Maybe our friends or family have stopped and said, hey, you know, what's going on? You just seem like you're not yourself. Once we know there's a problem, how do, how do we realign ourselves into God's purpose? And I would say sometimes in different seasons, as things shift, a grace may lift off of what we were doing. So sometimes, you know, God's partly calling us into a different season. So if we know something's wrong, how do we get back in that track so we can keep moving forward? Yeah, for sure. And, uh, you know, it, it's not like here's step one, two, three. I wish it was that easy. Um, Never is. In hindsight, better. it might look like that, but it's way messier. Oh, at way messier. <laughs> and, and it does require a, a lot of uh, discernment and and work with the Holy Spirit as well, uh, you know, in, in that sense of going, okay. Um, and for me, that's how, that's how I felt. There was a, a different way when I say, coming back. I mean, we're in 2021 and I, I'm, I'm feeling like I'm just getting my mojo back, you know, and going, okay, now I'm firing on all cylinders. Um, but it's giving yourself the grace to go, okay, this is, you, you can't live in denial. Denial is what's going to destroy you. So by pushing things down and saying, you know, this is not an issue, or I think that is, that is how you're going to drift. You've got to decide, okay, where is my anchor not set securely right now. Now, if Jesus is this hope we have as an anchor for our soul, both firm and secure, you've got to make sure that your soul is anchored. So this is not an issue of salvation. It's an issue of being anchored while we're here and being and going, okay, so it, whatever the area might be, whether it's uh, scripture, whether it's church, whether it's trusting God, whether it's uh, getting healing on the inside. I mean, through the book, I go through nine different things that give you a sign that go, look, you know you're drifting if this is happening. And you uh, you may not be aware of it, but it is inevitable that your anchor is not secure in this area. And so you are going to drift. And what I found was there was, I just had to go, okay, let's reset the anchor again. Chris, when it comes to your, your, your practices, um, you know, you're a Christian leader. So what you do is you you write sermons, you write books. This is what you do for a living. So how about we get anchored now in terms of your own devotional life? Where Where is this going? And, and where do you need to reset that anchor again and find freshness in this thing again? And when it comes to your prayer, when it comes to fasting, when it comes to um, just your own healing of, of what the Lord wants to do in a, in a deeper area in my own life, where have I stopped trusting God and controlling my circumstances more and more with it's just even being willing enough to go I can't deal with everything all at once but as the Holy Spirit reveals a certain area it's never to harm me um I think it comes back to trusting the character and nature of God that if God is good and God does good um then anything he is allowing me to go through in this season is to reveal a potential uh weakness in me that he wants to strengthen or an area of bondage where he wants to bring healing and the more healed and the more free I am, the more effectively God can flow through me to impact other people. I think it's, especially if you're in a leadership role, if you start to think that God doesn't want to deal with us anymore, you know, when you're used to being the person that's got all the answers, um, you can forget that you and I are a work in progress all the time. And that our sanctification, our own personal sanctification is very important, that we are growing daily into and being conformed into the image of Jesus Christ. And that happens at the same time as you're leading, at the same time as, um, and I think the day you think God no longer needs to work on you is the day that you have drifted out to the, to the and, and then you sort of read something and go, wow, how did that leader fall or get into that moral situation or, you know, um, but it didn't start there. It normally started that somewhere there were signs and if you choose to ignore those signs, you're just going to keep drifting out to sea. Um, and I think it's very liberating to go, whether you're a leader or anyone, we're ultimately, and first and foremost, we're all just, we're all Jesus followers. We're all part of the body of Christ. And we are all a work in progress. And um, we are all recipients of the gospel of grace. The day I stop needing that, there's a problem. There's a problem when I think that, you know, so um, because then you put unrealistic expectations uh, on yourself. Now, others are already putting unrealistic expectations on you, so that's hard enough to manage. Um, but you will fail. You will make mistakes, and you need a place uh, where you can be a recipient of the grace that you're dispensing to others at the same time. And I think we've gotten in a world 
where we've forgotten that kind of stuff. So we, you know, we are, um, are ending up drifting away from I loved what you said. It's back to basics. I don't know that you ever get away from basics. The, the Christian life is is very simple. It's not easy to live, but it's not complicated. Uh, we want to complicate it, um, but the fact is. So you know, you got to check your anchor and go. Hang on a minute. Where is my hope really rooted? Where is my joy really rooted? Where is my peace really rooted? Where is my sense of identity or significance or security? It is back to basics because all of that is being shaken. And the writer to the Hebrew says, only those things that can be shaken will be shaken, so that those things cannot be sh- that cannot be shaken will remain. Well, we have been in a shaking the last four years, um, and leaders are being shaken like everybody else. And so it is a time to go, what, what was the excess baggage that I was carrying that I didn't uh, need to? Um, where had I drifted from my mission? Where had I drifted from my purpose? Where had I drifted from my first love? Now, If Jesus can be talking to some of the greatest churches in the book of Revelation and say, look, you're doing awesome, but I've got this against you. You've left your first love. And he goes through uh, the seven churches. You sit there and go, I don't know why we would think that he's not wanting to deal with us in this hour. Yeah, the one thing that I keep thinking about as you've been talking is that we need to be willing to have grace for others, but also grace for ourselves. And especially Uh, If we're in leadership, when we all lead to some capacity, we all have influence over our friends and our children. There are are people that look up to us. Um, I I was at an event last month and I sat down at breakfast with uh, Bill Johnson, who's one of my my favorite authors. um, And we asked him a theological question and he said, I don't know. I've never actually thought about that specifically. And I just appreciate leaders who we look up to, people who we revere and we've read all their books having the humility, but also the grace for themselves to say they don't know and just have a discussion or a conversation about something. Um, in the same way, we, we have to have grace for people if they give us an answer like that. I feel like um, as leaders, we need to ha- give ourselves the grace to be, to be willing to, to not be performing and projecting and being like, I'm, I'm perfect. I'm up on this, like to get off the soapbox and just be a normal person having a conversation sometimes. Um, kind of, I, I, I always say kind of down in the dirt, playing with the normal people it's important for that to be kind of a two-way thing. Like for people we look up to, we need to give them that grace, but they also need to give themselves the grace just to not always be on. Cause that's exhausting to always be performing, uh, putting ourselves out there like that. Uh, almost time for us to wrap up. So uh, we'll get into some, uh, a few closing questions here uh, in terms of the reader's journey with the book for everybody who picks this up, like what, what's that takeaway that that one big impact you hope every single person discovers in these pages? You know, the, that Jesus holds. <laughs> I want them to know G- Jesus holds, that he truly is uh, this hope we have as an anchor for our soul. And, the, and our anchor, it's even better news than a ship's anchor that goes down to the seabed. Our anchor holds behind the veil. It is eternally secure. And, um, you know, there is not, you can't drift you can't outdrift the grace of God or the love of God or the mercy of God. You can't drift out so far that he's not there. And the fact is that in a world of shifting currents where I know a lot of leaders, a lot of Christians are just feeling so uh, overwhelmed by, by the rapid changes and just what is happening culturally, um, sociologically, you know, in every realm of society that Jesus holds, that, that he is faithful. Um, and uh, you know, I'm sitting here going, he is absolutely fair. I, I don't know, I, I don't know what you got going for you that's better than Jesus, because there is nothing that holds like Jesus. And I think everything's been tested in our world. This little invisible virus that nobody could see shut the whole planet down um, for a year, literally sent everyone home and no one could see it. So I'm figuring, you know, this Jesus that we can't see, maybe he can open us up and give us a hope and give us a purpose. I've come back with like a vengeance, like, yes, I, the radical message of the gospel of grace and love and mercy is a message our world needs. And I think our world is more open to it than now. So there are many that will read this uh, that are on the verge of drifting. And I think this is going to be like, wow, let me do a little inventory. <laughs> let me check whether I'm drifting. Um, others would have, have drifted and are wondering have I drifted too far? And I want them to see that no way you haven't. Um, and, you know, still others in the midst of this is like, what guardrails can I put up to stop me from drifting? Um, and I, I think so no matter where you're at, um, you're going to locate yourself in it. 
And I've certainly, well, you know, my whole life is uh, pretty much, I don't have much, but everything I've got, I'm going to give to you. So there's nothing sugar-coated. It's like, this is what I've walked through. And I think it might help you and Jesus holds. Wow. That's a good re- phrase to remember. Jesus holds. Um, I would say too, 2020, and as we've gone further into 2021, it's been a refining season. And, and the the blessing of last year, I feel, is that it exposed the depth of our need. It exposed how much we've been relying on ourselves and our patterns and maybe our own talents and the things that we're really good at. You know, you, you've talked about being in ministry for three decades. You've passed 10,000 10, hours. We would say by the world standards, you are an expert, yet we still need to keep our eyes focused. Jesus holds. We need to, you know, kind of that whole back to basics thing. And so e- even though, you know, I, and I never want to trivialize or minimize the challenges, everybody had different ways that they were crushed last year. Uh, yet at the same time, as we're crushed, uh, sometimes Jesus comes out, sometimes other things comes out. Uh, but it's that refining process where we we realize the depth of our need and we are propelled back to Jesus, maybe like we weren't, weren't two or three years ago when things were great and things were happy and things were easy. So um, while it was a challenge, I, I always keep coming back to it was an immense blessing that we realized how much we need Jesus more than we ever thought we've needed him before. And and even though the news cycle is dark, there's difficult things happening everywhere right now. As I talk to leaders around the country, really around the world, God's moving in amazing, unprecedented ways. There are things happening in our generation that I don't think any of us expected to see. I always like to say, as we stand on the shoulders of the mothers and fathers who came before us in the church, we are living in the era they have longed to see. We're living in an era where the gospel goes further and further than they ever were able to see it manifest or maybe even dream that it could go. And while I'm I'm not necessarily saying we're that last generation, not saying we're not, if Jesus tarries, we'll, we'll see. But um, just just remember, you're in an age of the church that somebody who came before you longed to see uh, that things roll out to that level, to that depth. Uh, Christine, you have a podcast. I always like to have uh, my guests mention if they have a show. So when somebody finishes listening to this interview, if they search for Equip and Empower with Christine Kane, what are they going to encounter there? Yeah, it, it's some good fiery Holy Ghost preaching. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm going to help inspire you by the grace of God through the word of God uh, to keep going, to to keep pursuing Christ and to lay a hold of all of that for which he has laid a hold of you. So I, I, I think you're going to find a lot of, um, you know, obviously rooted in scripture, the word, but um, highly inspiring content to to help inspire you to keep going. And who doesn't need that every day right now? Um, <laughs> and, and for people to find out more about your ministry, the book, where do we discover you on the web? Oh, everywhere. Christine Kane, you'll find me. ChristineKane.com. It's just, yeah, I'm, I'm there on all the things. All the things. Yes. All the social media things and elsewhere. Uh, but like we do with every episode, we'll make it easy. We'll have links in the show notes for places you can connect with Christine and the places you can pick up your very own copy of her brand new book. It's time to bring this episode of the Sean Tabbitt Show to a close. Many thanks for being a part of my conversation with Christine Kane. Once again, our book today was How Did I Get Here? Finding Your Way Back to God When Everything is Pulling You Away. For one, Christine, her book, her ministry, all the things. A great place to start is her website. You can find that over at christinecane.com. And Christine, I want to say thank you so much for sharing with us today. It's been an honor. It's been a pleasure to have you on the show. It's been my honor. Thanks for having me.